Welcome to another episode of Girl Stampede, where we highlight women in the board game industry and their experiences as gamers. Today, I have with me Julie Ahern of Greenbrier Games. Hi, Julie. Hi, Jess. <laughs> I mean, we don't talk uh, twice a day already as it is. We might as well do it Every online. Every day, yeah. yeah. <laughs> might as well bring it to all of you folks. So right now, the hot topic is Spiel Virtual is going on. Um, I know. I'm missing Essen big time. What about so you? So bad. <laughs> so much. So bad. I Yeah, it's... Um... It's sad. I it's very sad. I yeah. keep like getting emotional and it's so silly because you know, it's there's been plenty of conventions. Yeah. There's been tons yes. that we've missed this year. Yes. And you still get to talk to people online. Mm -hmm. Um but but it's just not the same. So I keep seeing pictures. Yes. Uh, posted the one of us from two years ago. Yep. And it's just those little moments where you're like, remember the remember back when we were in Amsterdam? Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because this is... But it's still ridiculous because like, I was in Amsterdam. Yes. It's, it, Essen is our Christmas in the industry. I mean, right. it's, Absolutely. of course, we see each other all year at different conventions and some of them big like Gen Con and Origins and some of them smaller like, you know, PAX Unplugged or some of the regional PAX. But yeah. all of them just don't compare to what spiel is uh, spiel is just it's the circus it's where everything comes together and some of the designs we're going to see come to the states i mean it's just it's incredible and it, take, and it has that kind of i mean yes i i understand that like gen con is huge and amazing and massive mm -hmm. but because you're from the united and united states and actually i live in indianapolis right it doesn't have that I don't know, magical quality to it of yeah. being somewhere else. Yeah. Which, you know, is just, yes, it's silly, but like also the food is different. And yes. All the different people talking in so many different languages around you all at once, which you don't get to experience in the United States nearly as much, but still no. everybody talking and communicating and enjoying their common interest, which is made even more so because you're communicating in so many different languages. I don't right. know, there's so much to it. Yeah, it's so many people from so many different areas are coming around. It's global versus, you know, Gen Con is very centered around North America. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so you have this global community coming together. But again, we've traveled throughout the year, usually, together so you know we're family we've gotten together for these minor events and that's why i say it's christmas because now we're coming together in this big event overseas and usually when you do something like travel to germany and <coughs> preface it with a trip to amsterdam or paris or somewhere as you adjust to the time zones you're doing it with your immediate family right or right. maybe a small group of friends and we get to do this every year at essen with our extended board game family where we're all there together and can right. experience and that, was that. that. So that picture I shared was the tail end. I really went to Amsterdam because the airfare was so much cheaper. <laughs> That's it. We find the ways was, around it now. We yeah. found the cheaper airfare was yes. like, well, if we do this and then take the train, yes, then it will actually be cost effective and I can offset that by sharing a hotel or Airbnb with some other people. And so we did. And I was there by myself and meeting up with my team afterwards who were having their own adventure, I might add. Yes. And so I got to walk around Amsterdam and go to hotels and meet up like, or and museums and do the touristy kind of thing. But also occasionally I would get a text and it would be like, we're at this board game store yeah. and see Daryl Andrews. Yes. <laughs> And then, you know, go out and be like, this was a fun little board game event. I'm off again. Yeah. And everybody else, you know, some people went to a toy store and I was like, no, I want to go see uh, the Van Gogh Museum. Right. And then come back and meet up with you and be like, let's look at shops. Yes. And find, find vegan, vegan shoes food. way right. cheaper than over here in the States. So that right. was fantastic. Right. Yeah. And then 
thank goodness for Edward yeah. for also helping us make it from the train to from Amsterdam to the train to yes. another train. Yes. To where did we? Um, I mean, before we get to Essen, you end up in what? Copenhagen? No, I forget. But yeah, we had to. We were somewhere. We had to. Right, switch. and we all yeah. we all had these super heavy suitcases, oh, and mine wasn't one of like right. the easy rolling mm-hmm. ones. And, and these really, trains have stairs. It's not stairs just up like and down. On. And poor Edward had to like <laughs> lug everything on Back and off for us. Which <laughs> thank you again, Edward. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so even traveling yep. on the train with you was this amazing, fun. It was kind of terrifying, but so grateful I had friends there. Experience. Yes. And then at, we got to Essen itself, and played the mind until three in the morning yes because why wouldn't you play board games immediately (laughs) after a day of travel of course you would of course yeah i mean that's yeah you've summed it up that is the epitome of the adventure that essen is but not only that i mean the games essen is unique even in the games that you're going to see you're seeing games that haven't come to the the states yet um ones that may not come to the united states May, and even if they're going to, it's going to be a year to 18 months. So, you know, especially... So, yeah. so switching from fan to industry, being yeah. a publisher, getting to see the things that potentially you're going to get to bring to the United States, which was the start of Lost Ones. Yes. Um, in fact, our first, you know, seeing of Dreams and Shadows was at Origins 2016. And that's where we picked it up because Gordon wanted to release it and didn't know, like just wanted to make a game and then released it at Essen and then said, I don't know what to do now that I've sold some of my stock. Yeah. What's next? next? And we were like, well, as a matter of fact, we have a plan for that if you're interested. So Mm -hmm. getting those opportunities, so getting those opportunities, but also getting the opportunities for like games from Japan that I'm never going to be able to see in the United States ever getting to experience those, see it like, Sometimes it's a good fit as a publisher. Sometimes it's just an amazing fit as a, as a consumer, as a fan of yeah. board games. And that's a good point because some of the people who are going there, um, they have an entire area uh, at Essen Spiel for uh, those who haven't been there that is dedicated to those smaller games, uh, independent publishers, people who are just getting a booth and showing their game off but maybe don't know the next step to take. They knew how to make their game and get it to that point, but getting it and mass. Uh, to gamers is not their forte. So it is an opportunity for publishers to say, hey, this really is up our alley. So um, first I want to welcome, let's see, we have Brianna, Sean, and Joe. Welcome, guys. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Um, But yeah, so what was it about Of Dreams and Shadows that drew you into wanting to help uh, Gordon with that? Um, So it was a couple different things. Um, To start, that was the one year that the whole company went to Essen. Uh-huh. Every subsequent year I've attended, and uh, um, Walter came one year. We've had other people uh, come and join us, but it was the one year that we went as a company, which as an experience was very intense. I will say it was an amazing experience for the vacation aspect of it. You don't actually always want your significant others helping you run the booth no. when you're the one running the booth. <laughs> yes. That got a little rough. And to mitigate that, we all took turns going around and getting to see everything yeah. so that we, there weren't so many cooks in the kitchen, as yes. it were. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> and it was Jeff and Zach who were out who saw it first. So they came back and like, we found this game and they're trying to tell me about it. I'm like, I'm selling stuff. I, you know, whatever. You found something. That's great. <laughs> Hats off to you. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't until we got it back to the United States that I got a chance to actually experience it. And it's really cool. It's Gordon has clearly come from, a, you know, a video game background. Mm-hmm. He worked on a lot of MMOs and he's that was his and RPGs, online RPGs. So that was his background. And so he did something that I hadn't seen in board games and it's not crazy radical it's not so far out there that you're like this is unfamiliar to me but it absolutely invokes that that video game feel to mm-hmm. it um of course 
dark fantasy, gothic fantasy, that quasi horror fantasy is our wheelhouse. So that was a no brainer. The art was amazing. That was a no brainer. His writing is beautiful and like almost poetic. You feel like you're in a fairy tale. That was a no brainer. But to me, the gameplay feeling like you are, you know, a character in one of the like, so you're in Skyrim. Mm hmm. Like, like I, I could see my character running around like that and, right. and trying to level up and trying to stop the small minions and then they start to level up and they get to be bigger as you start to level up. Like I could see my character doing that mm -hmm. while I was playing while still having this beautiful, you know, art experiencing and talking and working with the other players in a more organic way, like you do in an MMO, where you can choose to go off and do your own thing, or you can choose because you know that the boss monster is five levels higher than what you are, so you need a ton of people to go in there if you're going to get the the loot to be able to level up, or you're going to have to go fight other smaller things to level up. It has right. that absolute feel, yeah. Without, which is something that was completely unique. So. Between like all the stuff that I was like, yes, this is what we do. Yeah. Well, that's give the thing. Me the, that's give me unique. the horror fantasy. Right. <laughs> it's definitely unique, but you have a background um, at Greenbrier with other games that are adventure type games where you're going in and choosing between side quests and learning and gathering before you go into battle. So you had that that to draw on to say, okay, we know how to market this we know how to develop this right. we know how to get this to more people and and for us it was it was something that was similar to the other games we do without stepping on the toes of say folklore right um so it did something unique mm -hmm. that that had a same feel of world ish yes but not not a same feel of gameplay and so that's what that's what drew us in Working with Gordon is what absolutely sold me, though, because working with Gordon has, for years now, been one of the most wonderful <laughs> partnerships yeah. and experiences. He is a great human. He is a creative mind, and he is like takes that creativity and is willing to share it and work as a team, as a partnership. Um, from the beginning. So mm -hmm. whenever we, you know, it's very hard, especially as a first time designer, which I know he wasn't because video games, but right. as a first time designer, or when you're new to a specific type of design, it's really hard to be like, here's my heart and soul that I put right. into it. And now you're telling me all the things that are wrong about it, yeah. or all the things that we fixed. That's, that, that's hard to take. And He's so um like the best. He's textbook the best <laughs> in the dictionary. The best. The best. As working as a team, yeah. as listening to it and thinking of it as an ability to grow and learn, and and not that it's like oh, okay, sure, do whatever you want. It's yep. always let's get to the heart of what you're asking. You're telling mm -hmm. me that this is what you think is need to be fixed, and here's why you think it needs to be fixed, and here's why I might have reservations because of the bigger parameter yeah. but i think i know what you're getting at so maybe if we tried this to adjust it yeah. instead as a problem solving or you know this is your area of expertise right. and the way you explained it means you put a lot of thought into it i say we try that yeah. like that's that's the exchanges so working with him his bet is every single time is a, a delightful experience. Yeah, no, I look forward. I look forward to meetings. And yeah. how often do you say, I'm really excited about going to this meeting? Right. <laughs> no, never. That's it. But he's right. so optimistic and just so happy about things. And you're right. I mean, mm -hmm. that is textbook, you know, for any development team to have a designer who, you, no, you don't want them to just roll over and say, okay, yeah, we'll just do it your way. No, that's really not what you're looking for. You're looking for some pushback. You're, well, if you're working, if you're working on a collaboration, absolutely yeah. not. Like there are companies and I, there's no problem with being like, hey, we're going to take your design and it's ours now and we're going to we do pay no, you no, no, no. That's, that's a way that's to do also, it. But right. as a developer myself, I would prefer that somebody who has that insight, like, you know, that has been in this world, that has designed it, can offer Who has some... tried all the things that you might think yes, might make it better, but I'm has saying. already tried them. Yes. yes. 
I mean, because how many times do you go down a path where you're like, this is going to work, and then you tried a different player count, or you tried a different way, and you're <laughs> like, that didn't work. That sounded cool in yeah. my brain. <laughs> that did not work at all. So right. having somebody who can say, I hear you, I hear what you're saying, but here's what I'm concerned about, and give you that feedback where you're like, oh, you're right, that's not going to, yeah, that's going to save you so much time, help the yeah. process go smoothly. Yeah, I can't even imagine something better than that, so... That's right. incredible. And that's, I mean, that's clearly what's led to, this is, uh, you actually have the third game um, in this world, right? Right. Um, so we had, we had Up Dreams and Shadows. Yes. Um, Monster Within was an expansion. And then Lost Ones is now the next standalone game that is a very different style of gameplay, yes. but the same world. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a lot. So can you talk about the story involved in that at all? Like just an overview of where yeah. we are when we start at um, uh, Of Dreams and Shadows and then what the expansion brings and then where we now are at Lost Ones. Right. So in Of Dreams and Shadows, you're in the Four Kingdoms, which is a fantasy realm, um, you know, of, of in, in, as in many fantasies where you're in that kind of medieval renaissance time frame. Yeah. Um, and the world itself isn't particularly magical, but superimposed is other worlds. Mm -hmm. And in Of Dreams and Shadows, you're in the four kingdoms and the other world is trying to creep in um, and take over. Mm -hmm. And there are different um, factions. So you pick the different bosses. So it just depends on which boss you're picking will, will determine which um, minions and monsters will be with it so there are three different bosses and then an of well i'll get to that so so <laughs> in that world you're playing a hero from the four kingdoms right who is banding together with other heroes to keep back this invasion as it were mm -hmm. um the monster within takes those characters and the characters themselves between um in the game you have you have your turn where you get much like a, a lost ones when we get to it you'll see you have an action pool and you get to do three of them but those things are moving attacking which is not just card based but also dice rolls and um trying to level up by gathering either doing side quest kind of things or um, purchasing cards which are your level up cards right so those can be equipment companions spells uh, you know some of them cost money some of them cost your power points of some kind mm -hmm. so it's a it's a you know varying degrees of leveling up depending on the characters and then the characters themselves you have two fighters two rogues two sorcerer types so you have a lot of the similar archetype of character classes right. while you play um so that's what work happens in that game in the monster within at the end of the core game there is this narrative element if you defeat the monster where you get a choice uh, do you slay the monster or do you banish them do you imprison them there's a couple different choices and you get a little bit of flavor text to go with mm -hmm. it in the expansion it's now seven years later and that young hero who's idealistic and good and serving for the right mm -hmm. has seen a lot of things right they've, they've, <laughs> they've, they've gotten a little jaded they've, had... they've gotten right and mm -hmm. so you know it's they're they're not quite sure why they're it's more like going through the motions so the monster within is literally the monster within yes. you're no longer you know <laughs> always fighting the monster sometimes you're fighting with yourself to actually keep going and fight the monster um we get real dark <laughs> gets, we get real dark um, I, yeah it's thematic though also, you're getting accurate instead right. of just being you know keeping it all fantasy you're putting the human humanity into it <laughs> try it we're trying yeah um but also to reflect that depending on your choice which was only flavor text in the core game right you so if you ch chose to banish the morrigan the Morgan is still alive, which means you now pull out certain things of her deck and put in new things of her deck because she's also has had seven years to seek vengeance. And so right. she's coming back and she has made some changes to her strategy. And you're also taking out several cards from your deck and putting in new ones because that affected you. 
and your ability to fight. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how that works out in that world. So lost ones flip it on its side. We're now no longer, we're not in the four kingdoms. We're in the other world. Right. And you're a kid from the four kingdoms. Actually the four kids are one from each of the four kingdoms to start who have been pulled into the other world and are trying to find their way home. And they're not heroes. They are kids. Right. They, who don't know how they got there. So it's a sequel, kind of a prequel. Right. <laughs> kind of not. It's kind of happening in the middle of the timeline of the other ones. Okay. Um, and, and like of Dreams and Shadows, like I said, there's an action pool. But instead of it being stuff to get equipment and companion and hero stuff, it's your own inner resolve because you're a kid. So all mm -hmm. you have is What's the desire, the, the curiosity yeah. and sense of adventure and disregard for danger <laughs> that only the young can have. Yes. Uh, so like, like in Goonies. Right. <laughs> or, or in a never ending story where you mm -hmm. don't think about the consequences because you've never experienced any consequences yet. So that's how you're able to just be like, hmm, I am in a strange land. Let's see what's down this path. Right. This seems cool. So that's that's kind of the flip side of it. I love it. So you went to the monster within and now we're back to the child, basically. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's an awesome evolution of a story. And, you know, today we were going to talk. We are talking about, you know, story and adventure and board game. And, you know, everything you're saying there just reminds me of you know, uh, a series of books, right? Where it's like you start with this one kind of focus or arch and then it goes into the next and there's this arch and then, you know, maybe they bring in this other and that's, it really feels like a story. Like you're building um, almost a series of books, but as board games. Do you ever feel that way? Like you're writing? Oh, it's absolutely, it's an interwoven narrative. And yeah. so it's Gordon. I mean, I get to do the editing and the d game dev, but it's all in his head. And we've talked about it many times. And I do appreciate that because I love this. Clearly, I love it. Yeah. Clearly, I think it's amazing. But he, clearly, he knows that and trusts me yeah. to, because I, I have lived in this world now. And being somebody who's also a writer who's lived in my own worlds, I don't don't like to mess up somebody else's sandbox. You know, right. I want to be respectful when I'm playing in somebody else's sandbox. So I try to stay very true to that even when I'm editing things. Mm -hmm. So, But it is, it is Gordon's writing. And I will say that there's a lot more interweaving in Lost Ones that you will see. There's a lot more cross-reference back to Of Dreams and Shadows narrative mm -hmm. um, in the storyline and the clues of what you're trying to discover. And because so are there clues? Are there, as you're going through it, are you picking up things that are going to lead you to others or are there clues kind of interwoven into the story as you explore? Yes. That's yes, amazing. there are. <laughs> so well, think about, think about how I described of dreams and shadows. You're yes. in your own, in the four kingdoms and the other world is trying to invade. Yes. So now you're in the other world. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So pick that up. Um, right. But it's not necessarily, you don't have to have played uh, the other games beforehand. Oh, of course not. Of yeah, course you not. could come straight into Lost Ones, begin there and be fine. There's just going right. to be pieces that are callbacks that folks experience. In that right. You might encounter recognize. a specific type of uh, fey creature where you're going to be like, and of course the mythology is all major mythology. So it's not like if you, if I say you see um, a red cap, if you have ever read any kind of Celtic mythology right, or about fairies, you're going to be familiar. And if not, you could, you could Google it and be like, what's a red cap? And you'll have yes. the background mythology. So it's not, you know, it is common mythology archetypes that we're working with here. Right. So, yeah. So think not things that draw necessarily just back on that story that you have to refer to. Correct. That's amazing. So do you ever feel like you're writing a book when you're writing this? Like how deep does this story go? How much story is in it? <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot because there's this, so there's this bigger arc, you know, story of this ongoing struggle between two worlds uh, who both want to survive and thrive and maybe conquer. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are the through lines of the characters, which, like I said, 
take a, like our you're jumping like seven years ahead there's there's a lot i mean there's filling it's filling in the blank but still there's a lot that you fill in for these hero characters now you have these new characters that are entering the game that you can only imagine will they one day become heroes themselves nice. uh is this the next generation mm -hmm. type of thing will they have to carry on this battle that or are will they be the ones that actually resolve it and bring peace to both worlds probably not because you know that's not as interesting narratively but yeah. <laughs> maybe it's possible right what do they have within that? yeah that can bring them there that's amazing do you have yeah. to so i mean you are you it feels like you're full of stories do you have to like pull yourself back from putting my too brain much? is so weird yeah. sometimes <laughs> My brain is between, you know, like, so, you know, st writing for the apocalypse to start. Yes. And, you know, then also writing stuff for uh, the world of Barbaria, getting to do stuff for Champions of Hara, the world's of, like pieces of reality that are floating in a, in a, you know, in a vacuum, basically. Like there's, we, we have some cool stuff. Uh, the yes. collective brain is pretty fun and it's a fun playground, but it also means that sometimes when I'm, driving down the road and it's summer and the windows are rolled down and somebody pulls up alongside <laughs> if it's like multi-lane and I'm like waiting at the lights and suddenly I'm like they have collars that explode yeah <laughs> <laughs> um out of nowhere we you know like they, the they take off pretty fast as soon as yeah. the light turns green yeah um it <laughs> just you know yeah a lot of stories to tell yeah i i can tell um so it doesn't seem like uh any of these games are short for the immersive story that people are going to find as they're yeah, that's going what through. we do that yeah. is what we do that is yeah. our wheelhouse yep definitely definitely um now this is a choose your own path uh or it's been compared to choose your own path uh, adventure board game uh, is what would you say it's in any way a tabletop RPG or something that folks who like playing an RPG but maybe don't have uh, no, a GM? I, wouldn't, I would not call it a t because we do. We do have tables like we do that as well. Yes. Um, and we'll continue to do those styles of games. That is not what this is. And I know that that's, you know, sometimes uh, some of our other some of our fans who that's what they, you know, so again, the apocalypse, grim slingers, yes, um, and and folklore, folklore would yeah. be on that vein. I would say Champions of Hara, of Dreams and Shadows, and Lost Ones are this adventure, choose your own adventure, choose your own path, mm -hmm. narrative driven, but not RPG uh, type of game. So we do both, and this one is meant specifically to gear down so that you can play with your family. Mm -hmm. Where we're trying to open it up so that it's more of an introductory. The characters are approachable for kids. Yeah. The storytelling. I'm even telling there's certain points where I'm editing because I'm like, hey, we can go dark, but maybe, maybe if you have to eat the bunnies, we don't make it about talking about eating the bunny. I'm right. just. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So there, are, you know, making sure that it has that spooky haunted house you know being at Essen going into like thinking about like the um the black forest and and the kind of you know seeing the eerie quality of it imagining how stories like little red riding hood came about yeah. um getting that feel getting the shivers but not getting to the point where it's too graphic so that it is more of an open to uh family gamers which isn't always what we're going to do clearly Right. Apocalypse is definitely rated R. You don't want to play yes. that with your kids. Yeah, definitely different levels of story, but it sounds like also a different level of gameplay. So Correct. that, you know, it's more actually playing a game, making moves, you know, as you would um, in a regular board game versus, you know, the adventure part of it, right? You're exploring and doing that. Right. Um, versus just following the story um, and immersing yourself in that that you would do in a tabletop RPG. So, absolutely. More gaming. So, it's, it is more streamlined there's still plenty of choice mm -hmm. but the complexity is absolutely pared down the the puzzly piece of it of how to use your cards the most effectively is going to you know be the for the strategists yes i think it's enough to make people think it's going to give you enough to go back because again 
when you lose, you re have to reset the game. So mm -hmm. there, you know, I have had plenty of people who are like, okay, right now, start over, go. Right. And that's, you know, so you're, I think the gamers are going to want to do that and replay mm -hmm. it until they find like, do, but for a broader scope, getting to play it with people who are more casual gamers and yeah. kind of invite them into the world of gaming. I think they're still going to be really open to it. And whether they win or lose, are going to be like, oh, that was cool. Yeah. It was cool when you found the salamander. That was hilarious. Like that's. And that's I love hearing fun. that because that's it to me. Like I, I like playing all types of games. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call myself an Omni gamer, but I'm not going to like pigeonhole into, okay, I'm only going to play these games. And I think when we say family level or family style game, it's a little bit of a misnomer. And, and people who like the medium to heavy euros or heavier games start to think, oh, then that's not for me. And I hate that because it's not true. It's really, you know, I primarily... It's scratching a different itch. Yeah, I it had, does. I, so my, our second game was Ninja Dice. Mm -hmm. You're rolling dice and pushing your luck to try to, you know, you're rolling what kind of a house you get yeah and then you're rolling your skills and trying to beat the house by pushing your luck yeah and you have to match up the symbols and the push your luck aspect is the orientation of the die is mm -hmm. also important as well as what you roll um, so you can do the percentiles in your head but it also has to be where something is rolled at the right angle to affect another die that you've rolled right i we were at temple con in it's like southern massachusetts or maybe connecticut rhode island it's like right in that little it's right down in there and um it's a big warhammer convention oh okay i mean not big it's still a smaller convention but it's primarily for warhammer right gamers so we had the apocalypse which they were like all right like would sit down it's a good palate cleanser yes that was their their that's take what on, they think of on the apocalypse <laughs> right <laughs> Yes. And then I'm trying to get them to play Ninja Dice. And mm -hmm. I would get a lot of um, skepticism. Let's mm -hmm. call it skepticism. Yes. A lot of chuckling at my, <laughs> my offer to play a game with them. And then they'd start playing and they'd be like, actually, there's more to this than I thought there was. Yep. And that's my goal. I want yes. it to be simple and clean and easy to play and open to a lot of people. For those, for the games that we do of that style, but not like we never go with a light, a weight of one. We never do. It's right. always a weight of two because I always want the heavier gamer of the group to be like, okay, maybe it's not my everyday thing, but that actually tickled my brain a little bit. And I appreciate that. Yes. And I'm good with that. That makes me happy. I, you know, I, I'm okay. I, goodness knows we've played enough heavier games and I'm happy to do those as well. But I like that we, we can do the range. Mm hmm. Absolutely. No. And that's it. it the thing is, you know, I go to a lot of game days or did used to go to a lot of game days and you don't want to play, you know, Vital Lacerda all day. You can't just play that those heavy games constantly. Your brain wants a break. It wants to do something different. And it doesn't mean that something different, like you said, doesn't tickle your brain, isn't a thinky filler where you're like, OK, this is going to take less time than our usual. It's going to fill some time while we're waiting for another game to to finish up and those can be you know to me these are all about gaming experiences and th those can be incredible experiences the push your luck where you're like remember that time where you just kept rolling and you didn't do anything <laughs> why did you do that and you're like i don't know i thought i could make it happen or, and i was ex right and i was exciting. excited about this because yeah. it's it's still co like covering a lot of the things that we like when when he when gordon brought it to us and i was playing through it i realized it's also going to be a game that will get to the table more often. Right. Because it's a one to four player game. Yes. So if you're home by yourself, you can still play it. Yeah. If you have a diverse group of audience, you can still play it. Yes. If you have serious hardcore gamers, but you've been playing and it's like two in the morning and you're still not ready to go to bed, you can play it. Yes. It's a game that will get to the table more frequently in my mind. And that's something that has value in my mind. So where it, I love the story. I love everything about it. But I also know that it's a game that as much as I love some of our other games, I think this one will get to the table more frequently. Right. Right. So we've talked about how immersive it is. We've talked about the massive amount of story in it. Um, we've talked about the gameplay. Let's talk about the art because it's gorgeous. 
it's incredible. Thank you. I, I mean, I love the colors, that. first of all. Like, <laughs> yeah. no, see, I mean, it's, it's, I love the colors. I love the scene of it. But as I've played it and discovered more tiles, um, it's, it's really incredible. And as yeah. you're exploring, it just, it's beautiful. Yes. So how... <laughs> How did that much detail get into it? And yeah, talk about that a little so bit. So stylistically, it's you know two different. We have um, two different artists: one working on the map tiles and one working on the art. So Matt was working, also did the art for of Dreams and Shadows. Mm -hmm. And Gordon, um, you know, approached him. Literally, it was a. I think he was looking for again. You wanted to evoke some of that video game, you know, the cutaway scenes, right? Um, that you're in and you kind of have that uh, artistic, um, not cartoony per se, but definitely um, it still has some abstract to it. I feel like it's almost a watercolor quality to it. Definitely. And that's, you know, it, it evokes a lot of that um, early, like playing Miss kind of look to it, which yeah. I think is, is what Gordon was going for. And so of course, when we were doing Lost Ones, we're, we brought him on board and then the map tile are again that's gordon i i think knowing people in the video game art world he kind of brought people on board from there and it's mm -hmm. been fantastic um and they're delightful and easy to work with like so did the expansion talked about the expansion gordon wrote the cards and the abstracts we went back and forth made sure they were okay and then i was like okay i can sign off on nine nine tiles and that was like last week and this week he's like okay here's the uh, here's the rough sketch for all of them are That's you good amazing. with me i was like yes, yes. <laughs> they're all lovely he's like okay i'll tell him to finish them so that's <laughs> you know that's the kind of you know when you're working with artists and i've worked with some incredible artists over the course of getting you know for a lot of different games and it's i love getting new art you know yes yeah. yeah. We talked about the vegan shoes and everything. Yeah, and I, yes, you yes. Know, I love a good new pair of shoes, but honestly, art. I love getting new art. New yeah. art day is the best day <laughs> every time it happens. Fair. Um, yeah. I mean, I see your pictures behind you. My bedroom is the same. It's, it's pictures upon pictures upon pictures upon pictures. And yeah. the weird thing is I didn't used to have that. I had the, you know, oh, here, traditional, you have a couple of images on each wall and you don't, you know, and you're going to be good about this and keep it i have to rotate out i have so much art i decided i, I wasn't going to do that anymore i used to i rotated yeah. with the seasons and then i was like no no i'm not doing this anymore because i saw a picture of somebody who lived overseas and i think they were swedish and their wall was just covered it was just frames touching frames over posters just the entire wall was all of just art that they loved and these were things that they loved and i was like yeah, why, why don't I do this? I love these pieces. And yeah, so you're right. Art is, you know, fantastic. And to have that in board games, that definitely, this isn't the first time I've heard too, by the way, of artists from of the video game realm making some really gorgeous art for board games. Another, I'm trying to think what it was. Oh, something by Mighty Boards. They had an artist that came from um, Excavation Earth. Uh, it was an artist from the video yeah. game realm. Right. And that's the thing is they, they just think so out of the box for what we're used to yep. for a board game that it comes out in this just immersive, gorgeous world that isn't just, okay, let's just make sure it's how to move our pieces, you know, right? It's just, right. yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, we're, you know, the art book is our next stretch goal and people seem like really super excited about it, which makes me happy because yeah. I know sometimes people, you're like art book and people are like, uh, what else you got? Yeah. <laughs> Kickstarter. But I think everybody seems truly really excited about it. And I am too, because I've gotten to see all the layouts for everything already. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm the person that are like, so here's what we're going to do and look at, it's all clean in the background. And we're thinking, you know, like this, these very, um, you know, much more like a, a traditional art book. And I'm like, can we put sketches and all that negative space? Can we have some, like, can we add yeah. a little more? Can we just cram some more? So when you're talking about like frames, touching frames, you're talking about I want your walls. <laughs> and they're like, um, yes, 
Uh, I'm like, lot. all right, just think about it. Just think about it. See if you can do it. See if you can. I, I love it. Every night I lay down and look at my walls, I'm like, I love this. I love that I can see all my art and that it's all up. It doesn't bother me at least. And hey, it's my room. I, <laughs> I'm going to have as many pictures up as I want. <laughs> yeah. So, so really fun to show and share that yeah. as well. Well, it's an incredible game. It's, do you feel like it's hard to run a Kickstarter right now without conventions, without being at Spiel or having been at Gen Con um, to show this off? Have you found that? Yes. Yeah. This will be the last game that I've actually gotten to show, at least in some capacity, at a convention. Now, it was in its really early stages, and it was only a demo of like 20 minutes because we had like the first couple tiles and stuff, mm -hmm. was Last Essen. So I had the beginnings of a prototype at Last right. Essen. It was showing people and getting feedback on it. Um, this is the last game that we have that will have had that ability. Right. And it's, so even like this whole, I've gotten people like, so at Gen Con, tons of people signed up and played it virtually, but virtually is hard. Yeah. It's oh, we're all feeling hard. That. Yeah, we're all feeling that. And I've been doing it for, well, same. many years before any of this happened. I've been play testing virtually. I mean, since yeah. we, on Roll20 with, with City Apocalypse from the start and, and on Tabletop Simulator. As a matter of fact, I was, I was there for the first creation of the table flip and, and didn't realize when it said flip. Like, it didn't think it through. I was like, oh, look, new button, click. And it was like in the middle of play testing, and it was before they had the like the reverse, so it just Couldn't there go was back no in time. resetting. No. Yeah, it oh, was God. it was super new. I tested it, tested it, right and out. finished play testing for the day because yeah. nobody would talk to me after that. Yeah, they were like, "We hate you." Um, you do that? <laughs> there was there was no more talking about that play yeah. session. We just we just Didn't stopped just and not... reset for the next day. Yeah. Um. So. <laughs> And it's too. still just so much more satisfying to sit down it with is. another human being and touch things. Honestly, so your I'm... brain processes it in a different way, is I firmly believe, because when I sit down and play um, prototypes in person, I'm getting so much more input and understanding how this game is going to work out. Whereas when I'm trying to navigate how to move things and flip things and do things, online it just doesn't feel the same it doesn't it's you know you're still hearing the story I, I, it's kind of like audiobook versus sitting there with the paper book and reading and i don't yeah. think audiobooks replace that it just it doesn't um right yeah uh, I, I will even at that i've got you know so i've got my even when we're playing online i've got yes. our yes that i'm sitting here doing by hand same. rather than <laughs> slip flip on and absolutely yeah reading the rule books on there no 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 i will right. print out whatever it is right that's why i also have the pdf it. of the rule book yeah. so even though you can play it on tabletop simulator i'm like you no please still the have the rule book you can print it out yes right yeah yeah so i can imagine that's a big struggle and just getting people to see it because there are so many of us you know everybody has a different learning style that's pretty entrenched people understand that you know some can learn straight from a rule book some people need to have more of a lecture style like learn from somebody teaching them and some have to just play um to get that feel of a game so th that's where those demos come in it's really hard to replace that with something electronic i think yeah yeah so yeah so have you come up with any creative ideas i mean i guess it's tabletop simulator and tabletopia but any other ways do you, that, to get this in front of people that you've come up with or, you know, how have the virtual conventions been for you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, so doing a demo of this yeah. was well received. It depends on the game. Yeah. So the hard part of this is because you can go in any direction, we have had to make pare down the tiles so that you have to zoom way in and then zoom out. Yeah. which is not their actual size and that's right. made it harder whereas in the real if you were really playing it the table presence is big but it's not like you're not gonna make the whole map the map is massive but you never get through the whole map right in one play ever um statistically impossible okay so um i mean but that lends itself to replayability right because you're gonna get a different oh, yeah. map uh, every absolutely. time absolutely yeah 
it also means that you can, you know, partway through the game be like, oh, we went really far north, Shh, slide, yes. and, and keep playing. Um, whereas you can't really do that on Tabletop Simulator. So yeah. we've had to make it so it that part of it is probably the hardest thing in my mind for adjusting okay. because you can see the cards. And of course, you can do the hover over and, and have it. But, but it doesn't it, it misses some of the effect right. that you can really get. Whereas when I was doing the demo, because it was I knew they were going to hit, you know, three cards out, they were going to have to stop in any direction. I could make them nice and big and it had a bigger impact of what was happening in the game. Right. Um, it makes it hard as opposed to Tales of Barbaria. Gangbusters. I can play that on Tabletop Simulator all day. Like I can play it in person all day long, but I can play it on Tabletop Simulator because as weird as it is you feel more like you're fidgeting when you're rolling the dice so you can yeah. mess with the dice and keep them rolling and goofing off and kind of whack them into other people and, and it doesn't matter because that's the kind of game it is yes that gets rid of some of that need for tactile tension that that is lost so i feel like that one um i can get people to play and enjoy not like i i can run a lost ones and that's fine i just i feel like some of the impact of seeing it and and being the, there yeah and being there um, being able to look at the map from different directions and walking around the yeah. table. Like when I'm in person, people like. And the table I, presence of Lost Ones is impressive. Right. That's the right. thing. And, and it's hard to see that electronically. Right. And um, Dave says, the problem is also we can't play games in person. So the incentive to add games is just not there for me. Right. And I hear that, Dave, because, you know, we aren't doing this in person. I hope that games like this, like we we're just seeing this family style game where you it's open to more people. Um, do become, you know, more what people are going uh, are adding to their collection during this time because, of course, we have what are we, we're calling it now bubbles, right? So you have your family or you have a small bubble of people, um, you know, to keep everyone safe and socially distance. Uh, but you're you're keeping kind of a little core group because, of course, as humans, we need some human interaction and not to just be solo. But with your little bubble, if you get a game like this that has that breadth of like, okay, I could play with kids, I can play yeah. with family, I can play with gamers that aren't as immersed um, in the hobby, um, then it hopefully, as you said, Julie, could get to the table more often and even in situations like this. Because I feel like right now we're so going to everything being electronic, even TTS and Tabletopia and just being on our phones all the time. Um, and I worry about that because I don't want to be like I keep getting these screen oh, reports I, it's and it's never like you're be a on all the time. Like, for me. It yeah. will never be a permanent solution. What I do yeah. miss is so I play, you know, I had my, you know, community where I was if I was at a convention, the games I would play at a convention. I had when I was in Massachusetts, the groups I would play in Massachusetts, what games I would play there. Uh, in Florida and like wh wherever I was, I had pockets of, uh, you know, in, in Columbus, when I go to Columbus, I have, and the, each one is a unique interest level of gaming. So when you say not an Omni gamer, I'm not really, but I am yeah. because I will play any game that somebody's excited about because Fair. I don't want them to stop playing games. <laughs> Fair. Absolutely. I will try so even anything. So ones where I'm even like, if I don't okay. like it, I'm right, like, I'll, right. I'll do it. So yeah. right now I have, two two people who gaming groups me and one other person and one is for work yes and well the other one is also most of the time for work but also sometimes <laughs> for enjoyment try to try to pin in some right yeah. one's for play testing yeah so I, I have one person that i see on a regular basis that we meet and we socially distance otherwise and we play test yeah and then i have you know the nice person who made me dinner yes yeah. <laughs> And those games are either, you know, for playtesting or for reviewing. And then otherwise it's, okay, what's a good two-player game? Whereas normally I'm like, well, those are cool, but have we tried and all different kinds of stuff? And, you know, playing with my nieces and nephews who absolutely adore social deduction games, which I will do because right. I love them. <laughs> but also like abstracts. John loves abstracts, playing abstracts. I miss playing it. Like, it's very hard to play a two-player abstract, but you can do it with a group of people, um, even when they're 10 and 12. Yes. Totally easy. Yeah. Um, things like that that I just, 
it just doesn't hit the right feels in a two player experience. So no. I'm finding I'm going back to the same games right now over and over. Which right, is, because they 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 hit better at the which is okay player. because yeah. you know that's also kind of a new experience for me. True, as that's of not late. what we used to do. So that right. is you know hitting different notes for us. And Sean says I'm actually buying as many or more games now as a way to support my friendly local game store and publishers during these crazy time. When we get back together, it'll be crazy. And yes, Sean, like that's the thing is yeah. I am picking up games more than I would be. I'd usually just, you know, get them at conventions or publishers would, hand, you know, be like, hey, can you write something up on this? But yeah. instead, I want to make sure that those stores are there um, when we go back. And, Agreed. Yes. Agreed. And, and the publishers as well, that they're making it through. So supporting, and I know I'm not alone in that. Like, you know, a lot of my friends are, you know, we used to kind of ask each other, that's another interesting impact. We used to ask each other, are you getting this game or am I going to get this game? Because if we're playing games together all the time and always having game days, we didn't right. all need to buy a copy of the game, right? Now we're not really doing that anymore. We just all buy it because we're not going to see each other. So we all need a copy. Um, so hopefully that helps make up for it a little bit um, to the stores and to the publishers as well. Because we do need to keep that up if we're going to have those to make Correct. more games. Oh, 100%. Absolutely. When it goes back. So, yeah, don't give up on it. Um, yeah. And Brianna says, it's been the opposite for us. Many, many, many games have come or will be coming since our game group, game group is 99% Corey and myself. Yeah, and hi, Corey. And Mark Street as well. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, oh, I hi, mean, Mark. Yeah, Mark. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you're playing a lot of two-player, then not much has changed. You're still probably playing a lot of two player together so that doesn't impact yeah. um and hopefully you're going to be seeing a lot of these games coming out that really do satisfy that two player um you know player count as well since that's where we are right now agreed oh, i like the chances uh, i have more liquid funds for games than spending so much less on other things that i would be out doing and that's true we're not going to the movies we're not going out for drinks or you know Getting take Spending out. a couple extra days in Amsterdam before Essen? Yes. Yes, exactly. So I have, I do have more liquid funds. Yes, days. more liquid funds, not traveling. Yeah, so you're going to be holding on to those. Oh, Although, and I, you Go know, I, I have not been cutting back on board games. and No. I mean, if you've seen our collection. I have I seen yeah. your vast collection. It is yeah. incredible. Um, but that's what happens when you merge you merge yes. two very large collections, <laughs> I think. You end up with a lot of games. And you're starting to pare down a little bit, too, right? Because you have no, to... Not really. <laughs> not really. Like, no. My no. pairing... No, no. The only pairing down is, oh, the you both have this game? That's right. what I'm saying. Yeah, the duplicate. That's, that's our pairing down. Well, that's... well, it counts. It counts. Sure. My pairing down is, <laughs> okay, maybe we get the, the micro games for a while. Yes. Well, Maybe you bulk up on micro games and not the big box miniature. Who am I kidding? Of yeah. course we're getting those. Of course. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So Ben playing with my uh, mom gamer is joining us. It's 3 a.m. where she is, but I know she has a very, I know. Thank you so very much. young. She has a baby, so I'm assuming the baby is up um, and probably yeah. uh, getting nurse back to sleep. But thank you for joining us, mom gamer. Um, been playing with my 11-year-old um, little man, a lot of heavy euros. And he's actually enjoying it. He was never interested in the past because he would be into football and all that jazz. Well, that's awesome that he's joining you for those. And, you know, I know you play a lot of games with your kids. So, it, you know, it, I think it's a testament to you start playing and then they grow into those as well. I know that's how my taste kind of evolved, right? So, so well, I, it, and it depends. Like if it's something you do in your family, it's something you do. So when I talk about uh, my niece and nephews, the twins who are 13 now, yeah, I've been playing since they were two. Like, I found them things that they could chew on while I right. also tried to teach them to place things. Right. Like, just, just because. So, Riley's, comp like, on several different basketball teams and plays soccer. That's and, true. That's true, and, yeah. And Dan does lacrosse, and John also does soccer, their younger brother. But they also play board games, and to them, it's, it's just, like, it's just another thing you do. So, Riley, uh, two or three years of her 11th birthday, she wanted a board game party. And invited all her friends who are girls, and they were like, "You want a board game party?" She's like, "Yeah, we're gonna play board games, and I'm flying in an expert." <laughs> you, of course. Yeah. I can imagine this was incredible. <laughs> She's her mother's in sales. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, having a bunch of girls who are on her soccer team, 
learn how to play and we played mysterium was the game that she wanted to play so nice. we kind of like we went from we started with uh codenames pictures yeah. so that they could kind of do like an easier game to do it and then we went to dixit and then from dixit we went to mysterium so that it was all in that interpreting images so that like girls who had never played board games before or you know had played monopoly could learn like that skill set yes. over the course of the thing and of course they were all like can we buy this game we love this game we can buy this and they were like does aunt julie come with it yeah <laughs> <laughs> will she come and teach it can we yeah. just play with her this is great yeah. yes right yeah that's right. fantastic yeah and that's the thing my kids are always like you know what game do we have next like what are you working on what can you see can and they right. love that they see prototypes so Before for them, they whenever they get kind of, not that I think they do a lot anymore, but when they get goofed on, they're like, you don't even know. Yeah. Like, like, clearly you don't understand how this works. Like yes. they, there's no shaming them about yes. liking board games. Yeah. But there's also for when they go and play D&D &D and stuff, there's no shaming them for liking soccer. Like yeah. they're just like, this is just how we, this is who this we is, are. This is it. Right. This is how and I And is. I yeah. like that there's a lot more of that happening in the yeah. world. I do appreciate that. No, it's amazing the comeback. My kids are all playing D and D, and they're playing it with you know uh, the library puts it on now, and all sorts of kids. Like you said, I mean, it's jocks are playing it. You know, they've got the captain, of the football teams in there. Like there, yeah. it doesn't have the stigma like when I was right. in high school. Anymore. When I played D and D in high yeah. school, my brother had been playing with uh, like I we started in the I was fourth grade, fifth grade, and so was he. So like, well, he was in third grade, so I like he was. I got him on board when when he got to like fifth grade, and we we were in the same D and D group through middle school, and then I graduated and I went to high school. And when he got to high school, and you know was starting you know starting player for basketball, and then became captain, he he was way too cool for that. And yeah. I was like, <laughs> dude, you read every single one of like all like every. What, what series? Oh, what series did we read? Oh, so the Game of Thrones. Yes. We read like all of Game of Thrones. We read all of like Robert Asprin's book. We read all of uh, Neil Gaiman. Like we had everything. And he was reading them at home the same time I was. We were fighting over books when they first came out. And he's trying to like be at school and being like, mm -hmm. I don't do any of that nerd <laughs> stuff. I'm like, would you like me to pull out your characters? Yeah, right. Well, but this is where you have to differentiate, right? right? He's like, no, I'm right. not. I'm not the nerd and geek. Oh, thank right. you, Brianna. Brianna just uh, gave five forty nine Canadian. I appreciate <laughs> that, Brianna. I really, it, I do. It said awesome stream, guys. I appreciate it. So, speaking about story, I do want to touch on one thing um, and friends in the hobby. So, you're writing something for Frosthaven too, right? Are you doing a guest scenario? Yeah, I have to finish it. Thanks for that stress <laughs> reminder. The I mean, mag, the dig. You're I like, actually right. need to finish it. Yes. Like that this weekend, it's done. It's it's a dead stop. Have to finish it. Have yes. to be done. I need those yes. deadlines. I don't know about you, but I need the deadline. Isaac's too nice. Yes. He's like, could you please? And I'm like, Isaac oh, Childress. I'm kind of the, yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. He is too and nice. He is. I'm, I'm actually feel like I'm letting him down. So yes. <laughs> and it's getting finished this weekend. I can't wait to see yours. Like, and it's so amazing. He asked. Well, okay. Yeah. So here's my problem. What? I tried to folklore it. Fair. I figured. I made it way too complicated. He actually too... had to simplify it for me. <laughs> of course you did. Choose your own adventure. Yes. Choose your own path. Of course I you did. Did you guys catch that. this? Isaac Childress asked her to simplify it. <laughs> yeah. Like three times. Or three different ways. Haven? Yeah. I love that. I told you, my biggest compliment from Isaac was when he played the game I was developing, Lovelace and Babbage, and he was like, this is deceptively hard, or yeah. deceptively difficult, he said. And I was like, the designer of Gloomhaven yeah. just said this it's, I don't even know if it's different. I just made it way too complicated. Yeah. And I know I did, but I also, because because in folklore, you do, it's all narrative driven and not so much combat driven, but in this, I had to do narrative and combat, and it was... I. I did way too many pieces. I had like a timing element and like, if you choose to go in this room, it affects this room. And then if you chose to go in this room, it affects that room and either one, both affect this room differs. And he told me to pare it down. So this was a little I much. Yeah. Um, oh, 
That's yeah. funny. So hardcore Dave uh, says there were no Dungeons and Dragons when I was in high school. Yeah, I've heard about your high school days, Dave. You had plenty of other things going on with like bootleg alcohol and cops and part. Yeah, you you didn't need any Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> okay, that's Banker Dave. He's a uh, he's a character. He's, All right. He's amazing. Well, there was, yeah, there was Dungeons and Dragons in middle school and high school when I was. Oh, yeah. Middle school for me. for me as well, too. Yeah. We in the basement. Why do we always play in the basement? I don't know. We were always in the basement. <laughs> Parents just put us in the basement, I guess. No, I played at school. You played at school? Oh, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah, I was no. Like, that was like indoor recess. Every no, time. We, we didn't have any at school. I don't yeah. even think. I don't know. The teachers didn't really. Yeah. Nothing at school. I can't, we it's, did it it's not, usually I have the show. Right there. I, I moved yeah. it all into my bedroom. So usually like I have all of my editions and I still have my, I started with second edition. So I have my original second edition. Oh, you started with second. I started with third. Yeah. 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 I was a third, a three E. Um, and I wish, I like it better than five. <laughs> that, wait. I don't like change. <laughs> change is hard. Change is hard. You're there. I'm such a complainer. Like, I started with a group, and I used to stream this. We used to stream um, Splatterdink uh, did it, and we did a whole world of D&D. &D. It was 5e, and I'd complain to him incessantly. I'd be like, ah, I don't like this. I don't like how it's like this. <laughs> it's like, okay, fair, but it's still going to be like this. You just have to do oh uh, nope i moved all of it into the room sorry. i'm sorry i was just looking i have You're like, like is there all, any yeah. i have some of my original characters i figured i have but they're all in the other room they're yeah usually, i have a binder they used to be I, right I here have a bind how weird is that all of my childhood photos all of that everything is gone i have like three pictures of me um oh. but i have a binder that has all of my oh okay characters in it. that i kept that i was <laughs> Oh, yeah, my characters, my drawings of my characters, yeah. like their self-portraits. Yes. Um, and once my kids got into it, I gave them three ring binders. I'm like, you're going to want to keep them. You're yeah. going to want to remember. And they draw, well, mostly the 13-year-old. She draws a picture for everybody, like, of the character, so they have that to, they give their input, and then she makes a picture. Yeah, it's... It's amazing. It's great. But I can see why, you know, that's, or see the influence, I think, from your background into the games that you make and create for people for those same experiences that hopefully years uh, from but, now. So one of the other cool things, so yeah. you think back to middle school and f I mean, it's literally fourth grade. Right. How many people do you remember from fourth grade or middle school even? Like how many of those people are you still friends with? Oh uh, yeah. Remember them? Oh, I could tell you what they look like, but friends with two. Yeah. I'm still friends with the majority of my D and D group. Yeah. From fourth grade. Like we're That's still amazing. friends. I still see them on occasion yeah. when I'm in Massachusetts. We absolutely talk on Facebook all the time. Yeah. So you know, we <laughs> <laughs> for all the pros and cons, all the things you can say about the gaming, I'm still friends with my D&D yeah. &D group from yes. middle school. Yeah. You know, and have wonderful, meaningful relationships with them still. Yeah. So. That's what this is about. And I think these are the experiences that will get us through this, too. You know, we can't necessarily meet in person but getting together for games on tabletopia or tts or talking to each other or um you know there was a good review actually of lost ones by long distance gamers and i like what they're doing they're actually doing reviews where they tell you how you can play these games remotely right with folks so their review isn't just a review but also hey how playable is this if you did it with you know your webcam on your you know computer and just showed it and then moved for the other people can you do it can you not that type of thing um which is a great idea because that's where people are right now so yeah uh, you know and what can you play with your families and in your bubble like we said so these are good things um, good things to get us through never play D, D. maybe i should do that with my kids may i ask for recommendations so your this kids the are younger yes yeah so your kids are younger mm -hmm. so to get them started i would actually start with monty cook's no thank you evil um so the cypher system that monty cook uses is a step more towards narrative driven and less about the math and the graphs than D. &D. 
Uh, so you can keep in, and like right now I'm doing Numenaria. Uh, I'm, we're doing uh, games in there, uh, you know, in the adult version, but no, thank you. Evil does a pared down version of how to do an RPG, which I was running three campaigns for three different groups of kids mm -hmm. at one point. Um, so to me, that is the easiest and most accessible to start and it's cost effective. You get a box, a starter thing, and it has a couple accessories and they're lovely. And the best part about it is the title, No Thank You Evil, is as you play, because it's storytelling and it's adventure um, and it scales. So they have an easy, medium and hard based on the age. So you, their system is, I am a n adjective noun who verbs. And that's your stats. So I right. am a um, silly ninja who throws cupcakes that explode. <laughs> Whatever your thing yeah. is, which also is how the cipher system, you know, so as you play it as adult, it's the same setup, but each of those you're picking what the adjective is and it has something specifically in a book that it means. Um, so for a five-year-old, it's I'm a noun, I'm a ninja. Yeah. For medium, it's a, I'm a silly ninja who may be verbs or not. And then as an, an older kid, you're, I, I'm not only all of that, but I also have a companion, which is a, a met the monster that lives under the bed. Yeah. And like, so you, it, you can do whatever you want and the stats are in there and it's all storytelling driven where it's what you can keep in your head. So when you come to a monster, uh, you say, well, but I have a monster who lives under the bed, so I'm going to use my talking to let my talking points uh, to let or my smarts to let the monsters talk to each other and work it out because I bet they're actually friends and they know each other. And as long as you have enough smarts points and that's it, you only have three stats, speed or fast, strong smart and awesome and awesome is helping other players that is such a good way yeah because that you can remember and so, that is that is the bear i mean kids are keeping it in your head and keeping the stats yes. in your head you scale it you're down not, exactly you're not referring to that sheet constantly and, and saying, then you okay, scale it up yes and, and then, then later the term no thank you evil is if you're doing a story and it gets too intense for a player mm -hmm. a young player all they have to say is no, thank you, evil. So it's building in that self-advocating for a storyline oh that makes amazing. them uncomfortable. Yeah. So no, thank you, evil. And you say, oh, actually, it wasn't another monster. It was just a dust bunny. And it was from under the bed, too. Yep. And you keep going with the story. So that's my favorite. Like, uh, I've loved it since the beginning. <laughs> we were at Gamma. Uh, they, were, they were introducing it to the market. And so yeah. we're in a meeting with all these retailers and other publishers and different publishers were going up and taking their time, you know, getting their certain set amount of time to talk about their new releases. So it's a very dry, it's not a convention. -y, it's, it's much more of a convention in the traditional sense of a convention. And a whole bunch of people are talking about their new games and what's exciting about them and right. what the good selling parts are. And Monty Cook goes up, not Monty Cook, but you know, uh, they, and they start talking about it and you can hear the kind of snickering going on because it was one of the first games to do it. And from the back of the room, I'm new. I was so new. I was shiny new. It was my first Gamma. Yeah. We were a company for a half a minute at that point. <laughs> and he starts talking about it and I can hear the snickers and I didn't even notice. I was like, that's amazing. And yeah. everybody turned and stared at me and I was like, well, it is. <laughs> and now everybody at Monty Cook has left me ever since. Yeah. And it is. <laughs> They're like, she's great. Yep. <laughs> no, it's funny because Nuberia, you mentioned, I saw that at Essen several years ago and mm -hmm. it was up on the shelf and I, it has, again, really beautiful illustrations. Like the the box itself, I was like, what is that? What is going on there? Um, and I think it might've been you who were walking around with somebody I was with was like, oh, um, yeah, it's definitely for families. You should get it for the kids. It definitely get them into, you know, like the storytelling type tabletop, um, RPG, uh, but that it's, it's more for kids than your game group, but like, you should, you should check it out. Well, when you say it's for kids, like I see that's Christmas, the thing. Yeah. Christmas day and I've got a five-year-old up to a 14 year old yeah. sitting around in their jammies and we had found a time machine and had gone to, uh, Oh, now I'm going to forget what year, but whatever. When Babe Ruth was playing for the Red Sox. Oh, that's where they wanted to go. Yes. And I was like, 
cool. Let me Wikipedia for yeah. a second. <laughs> As the GM. Yes. Oh, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, we can do that. We get in the time machine at somebody's, uh, at the Queen Bee's birthday party <sighs> where we had to defeat a T-Rex. Yes. To get one of the components to get the time machine running. And where do you want to go? Boston, 1930, whatever it was with Babe Ruth. Yes. Cool. What? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, so that's, you know, it's, it, that absolutely encourages um, exploring and adventure yeah. and easy to remember stats and encourages kids advocating for themselves and helping other players. I, I, again, this is what. Thank you, 1916. Thank you, heavy cardboard. Of course, you know the answer. <laughs> but this, this is what we enjoy as well. And so when we say for kids, I'm like, I'm just a big kid. Like that's why I play board games is for those experiences and to have fun, right? Like, sure, I like to strategize. Sure, I like to discover what's in that. But that is being, you know, as Edward says, the world's biggest five year old. It's curiosity. It's wanting to learn something new, see unique mechanisms together. What isn't kid-like about that? So yeah, we can all have a great time enjoying yep. these games. So I haven't checked Numeria out yet, but I definitely will now that you've right. said that. Great Five-year-old and a 14-year-old and a couple nine-year-olds yeah. and a 12-year-old all in jammies. And my sister's like, uh, you guys want to play with your toys that we spent a lot of money on? And they're like, yeah, later. And yes. I was like, 100% that's the way it is at my house too. Who's, like I'll get them. Who's yeah. winning Christmas? It's, it's always that way. It's, you know, just adding those things all together. They'll get electronics, they'll get, you know, Roblox, Bucks, whatever it is. And the thing we end up playing, because they always get board games. That's just right. going to happen. The thing that goes over best, it, and they also get jammies. They change into their new jammies, jammies. And pull out the board games. And, you know, usually there's like candy in the stock and stuff. They eat their candy and that's what we're doing for days. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And yes, I am a big kid, as Edward says. It, why would I not be? I have, I'm an adult. I have a choice. I'm going to be a kid. <laughs> we get to decide fair. these things. So it's fair. Yeah. So the, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Is there anything else you wanted to share with folks? Um, we talked about a lot. We no, talked about a lot, a lot about story yeah. and adventure and board games. I think we yeah. covered that. I mean, Lost Ones ones on Kickstarter. Yes. So we'll end with, yeah, Lost Ones is on Kickstarter. So it has, uh, I think, about 12 days left. Less. A um, little I less. Is it, time is going by quickly. It's, uh, it's Monday, November 2nd, right, that it ends. Yeah. Time, is, time, is a, time is in a tube. It's it not is. real anymore. It is um, so much so. But yeah, so <laughs> November 2nd, that ends. So definitely go and take a look. Check that out. Um, if you're interested, you heard a lot about it today and how immersive it is. So And how gorgeous it is. So definitely uh, check it out. Uh, Edward's going to link the Kickstarter in comments. So you'll see it there um, yeah. as well. And other than that, I hope everybody's staying safe and being patient and kind with each other and yes. remembering to reach out to people because it's harder these days. And I miss everybody, all my Essen family horribly and terribly. Yes. Um, yeah. And I mean, we're all struggling right now. This is not the normal world. So yeah, reach out to your friends and family, be kind to others. Everybody is struggling. Uh, so Drink water. Give Make a little sure grace. Hydrate. Yes. Outside. Yes. Outside Which I'm doing really bad every at. once in a while. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm done momming. Yeah. That's Hydrate. It. Take good. care of yourself. Social <laughs> distance. Wear your mask. And have fun. Find breaks. Find games. Find things that are going to bring some nice things into your world, into the world of others. So, yeah. all right. Well, thank you for joining us, Julie. Thanks, everyone, for watching. I appreciate it. And take care. Bye. Bye.